الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي لا تراه العيون ولا يصفه الواصفون ولا تخالطه الظنون ولا يخشى الدوائر يعلم عدد قطر الأمطار وعدد ورق الأشجار وعدد ما أظلم عليه الليل وما أشرق عليه النهار ولا تواري منه سماء سماء ولا أرض أرضا ولا جبل ما في وعره ولا بحر ما في قعره اللهم أنت حق من عبد وحق من ذكر وأنصر من ابتغي وأرأف من ملك وأجود من أعطى وأوسع من سئل أنت الملك لا شريك لك وأنت الفرد لا لد لك كل شيء هالك إلا وجهك لن تطاع إلا بإذنك ولن تعصى إلا بعلمك تطاع فتشكر وتعصى فتغفر القلوب لك مفضية والسر عندك علانية الحلال ما أحللت والحرام ما حرمت والدين ما شرعت والأمر ما قضيت الخلق خلقك والعبد عبدك والأمر أمرك وأنت الله الرؤوف الرحيم وقد أحسن الشاعر إذ يقول فليتك تحلو والحياة مريرة وليتك ترضى والأنام غضاب وليت الذي بيني وبينك عامر وبيني وبين العالمين خراب إذا صح منك الود فكل هين وكل الذي فوق التراب تراب ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله يا خير من دفنت بالقاي عظمه فطاب من طيبهن القاع والأكم نفس الفداء لقبر أنت ساكنه فيه العفاف وفيه الجود والكرم أنت الشفيع الذي ترجى شفاعته على الصراط ما زلت القدم وصاحباك فلا أنساهما أبدا من السلام عليكم ما جرى القلم أما بعد قال الله عز وجل في كتاب العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أدعوا ربكم تضرعا وخفية إنه لا يحب المعتدين وقال عليه الصلاة والسلام يقول الله عز وجل أنا عند ظني عبدي بي وأنا معه إذا دعاني أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام My dear respected brothers, elders, mothers and sisters in Islam Today, human beings, mankind We spend a lot of our time, a lot of our effort A lot of our investments, a lot of our resources To make ourselves look better externally to make ourselves feel better externally, to make things around us better, to make our clothes better. I have a son, he's three years old. You buy him a brand new pair of shoes. So he wanted Jordans. I took him to Walmart and bought him shacks. And I told him, this is Jordan. And he's happy with it. He doesn't know what Jordan is. But after one, two months, he wants a new pair of shoes. He says, it's old now has stains on it. Similar is the case to us parents. You see that before we go to a wedding, before we go to a program, we spend a lot of time making ourselves look better, feel better. A lot of the effort we're spending in our lives is, how can I get out of this studio apartment and get to a two bedroom apartment? How can I get out of that and get to a condo? How can I get out of that and get to a house? How can I own my own house? First of all, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Islam encourages improvement. There's nothing wrong with that. We should do that, we should make an effort for that. But as we all know, no business, no, no business, no studies, no education can be achieved without investing time. Even a relationship, any relationship there is in the world, even a relationship between an owner and a pet, husband and a wife, Father and a son, mother and her children, siblings, the greatest, according to psychologists and ulama, mashayikh, Quran and hadith, the greatest way to improve a relationship is not to spend money, but to spend time. Spend time. A lot of times we give our children money and material, but we're not giving them time, so we don't see the same results. Well, all, among all these dy dynamic relationships that are in the world today, I was just having a conversation with a mother last night who was crying and crying to me saying that 
I'm, I'm such a bad mother. I said a mother can never be a mad, bad mother because naturally Allah has put so much love in your heart. So stop feeling like you're a bad mother. But tell me why you feel like you're a bad mother. She says, I'm always yelling at my kids. Always screaming at them. And I don't want to do that. I'm also pregnant. I know I'm affecting my other child too and I have two children. And I'm always yelling at them. Ever since the moment they come back from school, I asked her about her life and I realized that she's busy working as well. So she doesn't have enough time, so she's trying to make it up by giving them things, not listening, so she starts yelling at them. Among all these dynamic relationships we as human beings possess, you ever heard that statement, we, I wear many caps, you, have, you, you wear many caps? What does that mean? Like this man has many roles in his life. As a Muslim, we wear many caps. We are a mother, at the same time we are a wife. At the same time we are a daughter-in-law which is not an easy relationship, right? At the same time, we're a sister. At the same time, we might be a colleague. As a father who's sitting here right now, we may be a father, a brother, a son, a son-in-law, a worker, a colleague. We're all these different dynamics we're developing and we're living throughout our life. Above all these dynamic relationships, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, if we start putting our finger down on why the Ummah, as a collective nation, has reached the level where it has reached today. We were in Hajj, throwing jamarat, stones on the shaitan, while people, children, mothers, sisters, were being butchered and burnt in Burma. We were on one side, there's millions of people, Hujaj in Mecca, while on the other hand, there's Muslims being thrown away from their homes over there. On one side, we're enjoying building masjids in America, while on the other hand, masajid in Syria are being burnt and demolished. One of our Hajj partners, he met one old man. He was on a wheelchair in Hajj. And he started speaking to him and he asked him, where are you from? And he said, I'm from Aleppo, Syria. He said, subhanAllah, Aleppo is not in a good situation. How is your family? And he said that one day, I'm the Imam, I was the Imam of a masjid. The Imam of that masjid for 25 years. One day I left my house, and right when I left my house, I had 17 or 21 family members in my house. My wife, my children, brothers, 21 family members in my house. And an airstrike came and they all perished at once. Shaheed at once. I look back, I see my house, and all of a sudden, I can't go back to my house because I was being hit with airstrikes. So I start running to the masjid where I was an imam at. And I start getting, I hear bullets. So I'm trying to duck for cover and I get shot. So I fall on the ground unconscious. And alhamdulillah, I survived. While I was on the ground, I made dua to Allah. I said, oh Allah, I have served the community, the Muslim ummah for so many years. I was a good son. I try to be the best husband. I try to be the best father. But oh Allah, I have never gone for hajj. I have never been to your house. Please don't take my soul till I see your Kaaba. As I was on that floor at that moment, I get up, I go towards the masjid, the masjid is done. And today I'm here in front of you. So this young man, he asks one of our friends, he asks him, he says, you know, you have nothing to make dua for. You know, when you go to Hajj, you have a whole list of things you have to make dua for. Children, wife, this, that. So you have so many things you want to make dua for. But a person who lost everything, what does he have to make dua for? You know what he said? Even though this is not my topic today. He said that in this whole Hajj, we met him in Muzdalifa. So this is the end of Hajj. He said, this whole Hajj, I made dua for only one thing. So what is that? He said, when I got shot, he opened his shirt up and he showed us his wounds in his back. He said, one wound hit me, one bullet hit me right in my back, right here in the shoulder. So it sort of made me paralyzed with my arm. Alhamdulillah, I got movement back in my arm. But I don't have movement in my fingers because a nerve got hit. So now I am unable to raise my finger in tashahud for shahada. I have made dua this whole hajj that Allah gives me the tawfiq to raise my finger again in shahada. That's it. That's the only dua I'm making. My dear brothers and elders, while we're here and sisters in Islam, there is, a, there is turmoil in the ummah. And 
what we commonly hear from Muslims, and mothers, and brothers, you know what? One more Salahuddin Ayyubi rahimahullah, everything will be fine. We just need one Ali bin Abi Talib. We just need one Khal bin Walid. Yes, that statement is true. But what we don't know is Salahuddin Ayyubi rahimahullah, yes, he came to Palestine. He liberated Palestine after seven years of torment, after seven years of crusaders taking children from the mother, laps of mothers and throwing them on the ground and crushing them and being boasting over how much blood they have reached of the Muslim Ummah, saying some of, the, some of them saying, oh, the blood has reached our knees, some saying navel, some saying, oh yeah, we were in the streets and the blood reached the hooves of our horses. He came to that city, that place, and he liberated it. We talk that we want another Salahuddin Ayyubi, rahimahullah, but we forget to mention that yes, he was such an amazing man, but his relationship with his Allah was such, he never missed the hajjud in his entire life. He never missed the hajjud. After he became baligh, he never missed the hajjud salah. His, he, his relationship with Allah in regards to his salat was such that after he became baligh, and he was a musafir all his life, a traveler, he traveled all his life. In spite of his travels, he never missed salah with jama'ah five times a day. How difficult is that if you're traveling? If I'm traveling from here, I missed fajr and jama'ah today because I was traveling from Michigan to here. It's difficult. You cannot pray salat and jama'ah if you're traveling. This man prayed salah with jama'ah in his entire life. Khalid bin Walid rahim, radiallahu anhu, in the battle of Yarmouk, there's 60, and I will highlight two sentences of his. There were 60,000 people from Banu Ghassan in the battle of Yarmouk. And the Muslims, the general of the, general, the Amir was Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, radiallahu anhu. Khalid bin Walid, he says to Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, he says, Oh Abu Ubaidah, just give me 30 people, I'll take care of these people. We have dhikr, we have the name of Allah, and the Prophet said, the one who has the name of Allah in his heart is alive, and the one who doesn't is like a dead man. So if there's 50, 60, 70,000, doesn't make a difference. We're alive. We have Allah in our heart. So Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah listened to Khal bin Walid. Next to him was a man by the name of Abu Sufyan radiallahu anhu, a sahabi at that point. He said, oh Khalid, 30 people? It doesn't make sense. These are 60,000 horse riders, warriors. You're going to take 30 people? Khalid bin Walid said, Jabbarun fil jahiliyyah. <laughs> he said, you were so courageous when you were not Muslim. When in Badr you were in front, in Uhud you were in front, in Khandaq you were in front. What happened to you now? Abu Sufyan said, Oh Khalid, forgive me. I'm just saying, take 30 more, take 60. Take 60 people with you, not 30. Tariq al-Khulafa, Suyuti mentions this. So he looks to Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, the Amir. He said, Oh Amir, you're the one that's going to decide who's going to come to me because you're the Amir. But I would like to decide which people are going to come with me. I want to pick them. If you allow me to pick them, that will be great. Because they're going with me. So Abu Bidah Jarrah said, that's fine. There's no problem. But he said, what type of people are you looking for? Right? What type of individual are you looking for? Now I just, if you never, if you weren't paying attention for the first 15 minutes, Alhamdulillah, this is an amazing crowd. You were. But try to listen to this statement with some more closely attentiveness. He said, when he asked him, what type of person are you looking for? He never said, I'm looking for the best archer. I'm looking for the best horse rider. I'm looking for the richest one among here. I'm looking for the strongest man. He said, for those who are Arabs that understand Arabic, he said, Uridu rijalan law anna ahadahum aqsama ala Allahi la abarra. He said, I am looking for people, individuals, that have such a great, profound relationship with their Creator, with Allah, that if they raise their hand and make dua, Allah will give them whatever they want. Their hands will not go down until Allah answers their prayers. These are the types of people I want. And Abu Abidah bin Jarrah said, okay, no problem, go choose. And the first, he stood up, Allahu Akbar, he stood up on top of a hill, and he says, Aina Fadl bin Abbas. He says, where's Fadl bin Abbas? Come out. So Fadl bin Abbas, who was a son of Abbas bin Abdul Muttalib, who was the uncle of the Prophet who Abbas was that man. 
when there was a drought in Medina, Umar bin Khattab, radiallahu anhu, used to stand on the member of, the, of, of Masjid Nabawi. He used to raise his hand to make dua, but with one hand he used to point towards Abbas and say, Oh Allah, we Muslims are in drought, and among us is the uncle of Muhammad Rasulullah So send some rain for us. Before he would complete his dua, Allah would send rain. So he asked for Fadl bin Abbas. Then he asked for him, Aina Zubair ibn Awam. Where is Zubair ibn Awam? Then he asked for Aina Mu'ad ibn Jabal. Where is Mu'ad ibn Jabal? Then he asked for Aina Abdul Rahman bin Abdul Bakr. Where is the Abu Bakr Abdul Rahman? Like this, he named 59 people. 48 of them were Ansar, 12 of them were Muhajireen. But he looked for those people that had a profound relationship with Allah, that if they raised their hands, Allah would give them whatever they want. He said, if I have one, it'll be enough. But I have 60 of them? Before Asr Salat of that day, 60,000 people from Banu Ghassan were defeated. And this became the groundbreaking event in Islamic history. My dear brothers and elders, today we're not even looking for that person who raises his hands and Allah accepts him. We're actually even looking for a person who raises his hand every day. You know a child? A one-year-old child, a six, seven-month-old baby, is 100% dependent on his parents or her parents. 100%. Cannot do anything. Cannot move, cannot pick up a feeder, cannot eat food on their own, cannot change their own clothes, can do nothing. So when this child wants something, it doesn't even have a language to speak in. It cannot even say, mom, I want milk. Mom, I want this. What I ask you, parents that are sitting here, when that five, six month old dependent baby needs something or is feeling a pain or is sick, what does the child do? Can someone tell me? What does the child do? Cries. It just cries. It just cries. And the mother knows and recognizes the cry of her child. She knows when this cry is for something to eat, when this cry is when this child's in pain. She recognizes it doesn't even have a language to speak. Today, the ummah is looking for people who are just going to cry in front of Allah on a daily basis. And because more dependent than that child is upon his mother or her mother, Allah classifies us human beings. Ya ayyuhan nas antumul fuqara'u ilallah. Wallahu al ghaniyul hamid. O mankind, you are totally dependent on Allah 24 7. And the only one that doesn't need you is Allah. He doesn't need our charity, He doesn't need our ibadah, He doesn't need anything. Ali bin Abi Talib and I'll end with his small summary of his life. When he, Muawiyah asked, please tell me about Ali. Ali was that one Sahabi, one Sahabi, that he possessed all the amazing characteristics of all the Sahaba. He was so smart. He was so wise. He was so knowledgeable. He was such an eloquent speaker. He was so strong. He also was from the family of the Prophet the Prophet said, Oh, Ya Ali, أَتَرْضَى أَن تَكُونَ مَنْزِلُكَ أَمَا مَنْزِلِي فِي الْجَنَّةِ Oh, Ali, don't you wish that your house will be in front of my house in Jannah? أَنْتَ أَخِي فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ You're my brother in this world and hereafter. What does this man have to cry for? He's already promised Jannah. He's already promised that place in Jannah which is right in front of the house of the Prophet So when Muawiyah asked about Ali, he said, Oh, tell me about Ali. So Dirar ibn Kinana said, Listen, if I start talking about this man, I could talk about him for days and weeks. Every single moment of his life. Man, even if he used to stay quiet, knowledge used to come out from every limb of his body. Just by looking at him. Every corner of his, the way he walked, the way he talked, the way he sat, was so full of wisdom. But then he says, let me just share with you one night of Ali. And this was his every single night of his life. But I'll tell you one night. He says, one day, I come to the masjid. And he says, فَرَأَيْتُهُ فِي بَعْضِ مَوَاقِهِ مَوَاقِفِهِ وَقَدْ أَرْخَ اللَّيْلُ سُدُولَهُ وَغَارَتْ نُجُومُهُ He says, one night I, I walked into the masjid. And I see him, يَمِيلُ فِي مِحْرَابِهِ 
He's in the mihrab, this area of the masjid, and he's moving from corner to corner. And he's saying how, what time of the night it was. He says, وَقَدْ أَرْخَ اللَّيْلُ سُدُولَهُ The night had drawn its curtains, meaning it was the last portion of the night. وَقَارَتْ نُجُومُهُ Even the twinkles in the star had gone away. He says, Ali was a man, يَسْتَوْحِشُ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا وَزَهْرَتِهَا وَيَسْتَأْنِفُ بِاللَّيْلِ وَظُلْمَتِهِ He felt uncomfortable around any opportunities to earn more dunya. But he loved it when the sun set at night because this was the opportunity for him to sit with Allah alone. And then he says, يَمِيلُ فِي رَحْمِحْرَابِهِ يَتَمَلْمَلُ تَمَلْمُلَ السَّلِيمِ وَيَبَكِي بُكَاءَ الْحَزِينِ He said he would shake as if a scorpion poisoned him. That's how much he would tremble. And he would cry like a parent lost their child. And why would he be crying? He would be saying, يَا رَبَّنَا يَا رَبَّنَا يَتَدَرَّعْ إِلَيْهِ He would cry to Allah. يُخَاطِبُ نَفْسَهُ وَيُقَلِّبُ كَفَّهُ He would look at his own hands and speak to himself. And he would say, Oh Ali, what have you done for the ummah? What have you done for Islam? What have you done for that widow? What have you done for that orphan? What have you done for that person who's in need? What have you done for that traveler? What have you done, O oh Ali? Not speak to anybody else. And he would cry to Allah at night. And this hadith continues. He says, My dear brothers and elders, mothers and sisters in Islam, Columbus, Dublin, Michigan, yeah, Penn State also, <laughs> everybody and every place, we all we need is one person, one individual, one individual who makes it a habit, who feels that I have to make an effort in my relationship with Allah. Allah does not look at our external factors of our life. Allah looks at, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ صُوَرِكُمْ وَلَا إِلَىٰ أَجْسَامِكُمْ وَلَكِنْ يَنظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ Allah looks at the internal factor of our life. How are we from inside? Do you know, like a bride who's sitting on her wedding night, and everybody comes and compliments her and says, you look nice, your hair is nice, your dress is nice, this is nice, and everybody's complimenting her. The compliment that means the most to her is her husband's compliment. What does my husband think of me? Today, the world can think of us in whichever manner they think of us. But what does my Allah think of me? That's all that matters. When I wake up in the morning, when I sleep at night, what does Allah think of me? And I will conclude by saying, Finally, I will conclude by saying, many of us sitting over here, we have this very guiltful feeling of our relationship with Allah. We say to ourselves, I don't even pray salat. I have haram money that I'm earning. I don't even wear hijab. I don't even come to the masjid. I listen to this, I do this, I do that. So who am I to ask Allah for something? Who am I? I'm so weak. I had many friends that told me, I actually used to think like this when I was young because I wasn't born a scholar. We were born in this country, grew up in this country. So we had this feeling when we were growing up. But one amazing narration I came across, first of all, that explained everything to me, is that Allah's relationship with man is not like my relationship with another person. You see, if, if I have a problem with this person sitting here, inshallah, we'll never have a problem. But if I have a problem with him sitting here, we have an issue. We get into a fight. Six months later, if I need something, he's the last person I'm going to call. Because I know I already have a fight with him. He doesn't get along with me. Why would I call him for it? So we try to avoid those who we have bad history with. We avoid them when we need something. And we call those who we have good terms. And we say, don't burn your bridges. You never know when you need them. Right? Allah is not like that. And Sufyan Allah mentions, he said, listen, Shaitan, when he was told, inna ka rajim, you are deprived from my mercy forever. What is the first thing shaitan did when he was told this? The first thing shaitan did after he was told that nobody will be worse than him ever in this world. Ever. He's the worst. Destined to Jahannam. The first thing he said, Rabbi, what did he say? Rabbi, anzirni ila yom yubaathun. He said, oh Allah, he made dua. He said, oh Allah, prolong my life till Qiyamah. Even he thought, Allah is so merciful. If I ask him for something now, he would still give it to me. So Allah said, Inna kamil mundarin, Shaitan, no problem. Your life is prolonged till Qiyamah. 
Sufyan Tawri says, No man, especially no man or woman from the Ummah of the Prophet can be near this shaitan. They are more blessed just because we're from the Ummah of the Prophet So we should la tahqran ahadan nafsahu. We should never underestimate ourselves. Wherever we are, we get up and ask Allah for whatever we need. We develop our relationship with Allah again. And the second thing he mentions is, with a human being, if we have a problem with him for the last two or three years, when you ask another, why don't you make it up with him? You know, why don't you get back together? You know what they say? That window of opportunity is closed. It's done now. I can't do it anymore. And if we want to, it takes so much effort. We gotta give him gifts. We gotta do this. We gotta do that. He says, with Allah, even if you have left him for 30, 40, 50 years of your life, and one time you just confess to your mistakes, Allah forgives everything. Allah, غَفَرْتُ لَكَ عَلَى مَا كَانَ مِنْكَ وَلَا أُبَالِي Allah says, I forgive everything, and I will not remember anything either. Forget it, it's done. Your relationship with me is new. It's a new thing. I'm not going to think, oh, you did this to me last time. Hey, last time you did tawbah, and you asked for something, and you, you went back to that sin. So why would I give you now? Allah doesn't deal with us like that. So have a positive mind frame by developing a relationship with Allah. A lot of youngsters sitting here will think, oh, I'm doing all this, I'm doing this sin, I'm doing that sin, I'm doing this sin. So who am I to sit in front of Allah and ask Him? Wallahi al-Azim, dam'atun wahida. One teardrop is more than enough to extinguish the fire of Jahannam. A book called Kitab al-Buka, al-Riqatu al-Buka. Open that book by Ibn Abi dunya and he mentions Sahih narrations over and over again about people who just shed one teardrop. And that one teardrop, Allah says, a person who sheds, the Prophet said, a person who sheds one teardrop, the fire of Jahannam is haram for that person. It just requires us to do that. Allah make us among those who start investing in our relationship with Allah. Whether it may be five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day. Allah make us among those who think that our relationship with Allah is important. Allah make us among those that even if we cannot be in Palestine, even if we cannot be in Syria, even if we cannot be in Burma, our relationship with Allah is so strong that we make dua from here for them, Allah accepts our duas. Our relationship as an ummah collectively become of that of the, of the relationship that the Sahaba had with Allah, that wherever they were, Whenever they needed, wherever they raise their hands, Allah listen to them. Wa akhu da'wana alhamdulillah alamin. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salamun ala ibadi ilin safa amma bad. I understand that salah starts at 1:45, but inshallah I'll make my salah very short, and I'll just take three four minutes of your time. As we all know in this country, right? In this country, as I was growing up as a youngster in this country. One thing that we were always told, and young kids, we, parents that know this, young kids are very fascinated by superheroes. Superheroes, Superman, Spider-Man, and it continues. We have an institute, you know when the kids come to our institute, we interview them, we ask them names of Sahaba, and then they stop after two or three names. We ask them names of superheroes, they stop after 100. And then they know the each power of each superhero, right? What, the, what their costume is, what this is. One person, one, two kids, twins came from Chicago, for interview and I asked them, they had, they just went crazy naming superheroes names. I asked them, did the Prophet ever come to America? And they both said, yeah, of course, America, of course he came. So I said, which part did he come in? So one said New York and the other said, no, not New York, Chicago is better than New York. He came to Chicago. So I asked them, how come you don't know this? And you know what they told me? They said, our mother never told us these bedtime stories. Our mother never told us these bedtime stories. So I never blamed them for what, what situation they were in. So. One thing children look up to is role models, superheroes. One thing that we have missing in our community all across America, Alhamdulillah, as a ummah, we have invested so much time, energy, and resources in building infrastructures. And if we didn't have this, where would we be sitting down and doing khutbah? If we didn't have this, how could we peacefully pray and do ibadah? It's not easy to do in an airport, we're doing it here. Alhamdulillah, we have our infrastructures. But as you move on in life, you need things that are important at that time. When you were younger, you didn't need some things. But when you're older, you need those things, right? So right now, the ummah is at, is at a crossroads. That our youth need live superheroes that remind them of Allah and His Rasul. That when they look at them, they get closer to deen. When they look at them, the first person that came into my life, I remember I was at a, a khatara. <clears throat> I saw one man coming, and I saw him on the basketball court the night before. 
and he was really, really good basketball player. And the next day I see him giving a khutbah. So I told my dad, I said, you know what? That's who I want to become like. Just because I saw him on the basketball court, and the next day I saw him giving a khutbah. I said, that's who I want to become like. I want to be a good baller, and I also want to be a, like him. And alhamdulillah, I am a good baller now. So, so, and, so this is something that we, we need in this ummah. Leaders, scholars, hufad. Alhamdulillah, with this in mind, five years ago, we developed and started an institute in Michigan. 100,000 square feet school building on 11 acres of land. We started with 15 students. And now we have 170 students. 75 of them are boarding over there. And we're cultivating leaders for tomorrow, where you won't have a problem being an imam of this masjid. You'll have scholars that are born and brought up over here, that know the language of the land, they speak Arabic fluently, it doesn't matter where they came from, and they can relate with the youth and they can relate with the communities. So we have this institute that we started five years ago. We have 170 students here now. For all those parents who might want their children to come here, we have no more space for this year, but the 2018-2019 school year, registration is open. You can talk to me about that. I can help you out with that. And we only take 12 students a year. This year we had 55 students who applied. We accepted 15 of them. And the rest of them we put on the waiting list for the next year. So we, this is a very unique system and many of the brothers who came from Columbus came to this place. Second is, first, you, if you have children, you can speak to me about them ahead of time. Second is that if you're a parent and if you're older, youngster, and you say, I, I wish I was a kid and I had this opportunity, but now I'm old, I'm, I'm a, I, I, st I work, I have children. For you people, we also have an opportunity with something called Miftah online courses. It's starting in January. You can take information from me if you want to join this. It's re really, it's about tafsir, learning Arabic and learning Hadith and learning the seal of the Prophet ﷺ. And it'll be totally online. It won't take too much of your time. So ask me for information about that. Finally, I would ask all of you brothers and sisters who are over here, uh, on your way out, speak to me, spend time with me and see if there's any way to support. And this, ne and this, this weekend, we're trying to get six students sponsored because in scholarships because these students cannot afford they're from poor families and each sponsorship is five thousand dollars so whoever can do anything for us you can get from zakat funds you can get from donation we want we want this project to be done so these kids don't have to worry about spending their time in madrasa and school and becoming hafad and ulama Allahumma salli ala Muhammad ibn wa ala alihi wa sallam taslima. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Allahumma salli ala Muhammad ibn 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 Muhamm